from his youth. And David said unto Saul, Thy servant kept his father's sheep, and there came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of the flock. And I went out after him, and smote him, and delivered it out of his mouth. And when he arose against me, I caught him by his beard, and smote him, and slew him. Thy servant slew both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, seeing he hath defied the enemies of the or the armies of the living God. David said, Moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said unto David, Go, and the Lord be with thee. Our lesson this morning, we discussed in brief Wednesday night, kind of a preview of it, looking at uh, the underdog. And we talked about how the underdog is a competitor and is thought to have little to little chance to win a fight or a contest. And probably one of the most clear-cut underdog stories would be that of David and Goliath, which we'll talk about in just a few moments. But I want to show this morning what we can learn from underdogs. And we talked again. We mentioned this just a little bit on Wednesday night. But the, again, the underdog is someone who's thought to have little chance to win a fight or a contest. How many times have you watched a, a game and you see what we call an upset? Usually in March, we have what we call March Madness with college and the big tournaments going on and those types of things. There's always a lot of upsets. There's a lot of underdogs that have won, will end up winning a game that they, people have said that they've had no chance of winning. And so we see that in, in, in sports quite a bit. But really, underdog stories are common throughout history. And we really think about it, the Bible in many ways is all about the underdog. Because we think, think about how many times the faithful person of God has been victorious when in the eyes of others around them, they seemingly have no chance. We know that... <clears throat> Armies of God, who have been small in number, have gone against massive numbers and had the supreme victory time and time again. And so really the Bible has numerous underdogs and, and is really uh, filled with numerous stories about those who, who many believed had little to no chance at all. We begin by looking at David, backing up a little bit to 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 28. Because we notice here in first, and when we look, look at this, when David comes down to see what's going on, that he is first overlooked, not by Saul, but really by his own brothers. In verse 28 and 29, the Bible says, Now Elib, his oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Elib's anger was aroused against David, and he said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? He says, I know your pride. In your insolence of your in the insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. Now what he's telling him is, why are you here? Really, really, he's asking rhetorical questions because he's, he because this brother's already decided why he's here, because he says in verse 28, you've only come down to see the battle. He calls David arrogant there in verse 28. He says, I know your pride and in the insolence of your heart. He's saying, I know you, you've just come down to see the battle. You think about that question, why did you come down here? David was interested, as we know, as we continue to go through here, about this battle, what's going on, because really it seems to me he's asking the question, as we're going to go through here, the question seems to be of David is, why are we waiting? In verse 29 he responds and says, what have I done now? What have I done now? Is there not a cause? Now, if you think about that response, what have I done now? You know, sometimes when we're, we have siblings and they're getting upset with us, if we're smart, we never say this to our parents, but we ask, we say, well, what have I done now? You know, what are you mad at me now for? 
What do you have to come with me now for? That seems to be his response here. What have I done now? Then notice this next question. Is there not a cause? Well, for David, that's a rhetorical question. Yes, there's a cause. There's a good reason why he's down there. He was overlooked because he was not considered as one who could, who could help in this contest. He was an underdog and not their choice for Goliath. And we find here, they say he's only come down just to see the battle. They say, by saying he's only come down to see the battle, they're saying that we don't even mention the idea of him coming out and fighting against Goliath. That wasn't even in their mind. Their mind was, well, he just left the sheep off so he can come down and watch the big battle. Goliath viewed David as incapable of a victory. As we look at verse 17, not only uh, Goliath, but also Saul, as we continue reading. In verse 33, And Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine and fight with him, for you are a youth, and he a man of war from his youth. He's saying, you're just what? You're too young. You're not a man of war. Like this man, he says here in verse 33, who is a Philistine, who is a man of war from his youth. And then we know in verse 35 and 34 and following, David talks about how he's killed bear and lion and how that Philistine will be no different. And we continue reading. Looking at verse 44, and this won't be on the screen, but look at verse 44, 1 Samuel 17. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give you your flesh, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. And David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the army of Israel, whom you have defied. And so you come to me with these weapons. He's saying, But I come against you with who? Verse 45 there with the Lord. In verse 46, he repeats the response of Goliath about the birds of the air, but he switches around and says, no, you'll be the one who will be featured upon by the birds of the air. David was an underdog. He was not expected to win. His brothers said, basically, go home. You're just here to watch the battle. Saul said, you're just a little youth. You can't go against Goliath. And when he finally does go against Goliath, Goliath himself mocks him. So you can say very easily at least three times in that short span of chapter 17 that David is called the underdog three times by his own brothers, by his own brethren, Saul, right, the king, and then by the enemy as well. But we know how that story ends. We look at Nehemiah, who we've talked about recently for various reasons, but Nehemiah also was an underdog. When it came to getting the people motivated and to get them to complete the wall, Nehemiah was not expected to succeed. Look at Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 17. The Bible says, And I said to them, You see the distress that we are in, how Jerusalem lies waste, and, and its gates are burned with fire. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer be of reproach. And I told them of the hand of my God, which has been good, which had been good to, upon me, and also the king's words he had spoken to me. So they said, Let us rise up and build. Then up their hands, then they set their hands to this good work. But when the when Sinbalat, the, the, the Hornonite, and Tobiah, and Gishim, the Arab, all these individuals, they came and they laughed and they despised them in verse 19 and said, What is this thing that you are doing? Will you rebel against the king? Well, first they mocked them, then they accused them of doing wrong, which they haven't. So I answered, and answered him and said to them, The God of heaven himself will prosper us, therefore we his servants will rise and build, but you have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. They're saying, What? Well, you have basically no hope. You have no heritage or right or memorial in Jerusalem. We find in, verse, in chapter 4, they ridiculed them in Nehemiah 4 and verse 1. The Bible says, but, but so it happened when Samala heard that we were, were, we were rebuilding the wall, that he was furious and very indignant and mocked the Jews. He's saying, you can't do it. And he spoke before his brethren, the army of Samaria, and said, what are these feeble Jews doing? Will they fortify themselves? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they complete it in a day? Will, will they revive the stones from the heaps of rubbish? Stones that are burned. 
Now Tobiah the Ammonite was beside him, and he said, Whatever they build, if even a fox goes up, goes up upon it, he will break down their stone wall. They're saying they can't rebuild it. Whenever they do build, he's saying it's going to be so feeble that even a fox hits it, it's going to just fall over. Notice the reply in verse 4. Hear, O our God, for we are despised. Turn the reproach on their own heads and give them as plunder to a land of captivity. Do not cover their iniquity. Do not let their sin be blotted out from before you, for they have provoked you to anger before the builders. Nehemiah says, you punish them and give them what they deserve. Why? Because they're saying you can't do it. They're saying that even with, you know, remember in chapter 2, Nehemiah said that God was with them, right? And that the king was with them. But we find in chapter 4, that didn't bother these men to keep saying that you can't do it. And that your wall is going to be so feeble, even a fox will knock it over. The underdogs we know in Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 15 and 16 were successful. He says here, so, so the wall was finished on the 20th day of Elihu in, 50, in 52 days. 52 days. Less than two months' time. They built an entire wall around the entire city. While being, what, mocked? While being in danger? While having to build and, defend, and make sure they were armed at the same time? Verse 6, and it happened when all our enemies heard of it. And all the nations around us saw these things, that they were disheartened in their own eyes. For they perceived that this work was done by our God. Nehemiah and those with him were viewed as an underdog. You cannot build that wall. It'll take too long. It's going to be feeble. It's going to be weak. It's just going to fall over. You can't do it. Even call, they even call the Jews feeble Jews. The world today, as we move into our own time frame, so to speak, the world says the Christian has no chance. The world says the Christian cannot be successful sending against the evil that's around us, so they don't call it evil. Those in the world today, the non-Christian, say things like the Bible, for instance, is outdated. And therefore, for that reason, the Christian has no chance. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1 and verse 9, and, that, and think about this and tell me if you think this sounds like a book that's outdated. Here the Bible says, That which has, has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. What is that talking about? It's saying there's nothing new. That history just repeats itself. Right? People are the same, and the history just, you know, evil people rise, evil people fall over and over again, right? That which has been is what will be, that which is done is what will be, or what will be done. What's he talking about? History is going to come back up again. You know, people talk about socialism and communism and all those types of things. What, when we see that last time in the past, what happens? It comes up again in various locations. One well, of the most easy ways to see history repeating itself is looking at the trends of fashion that comes up over and over again, right? It changes sometimes, even during the course of a year, fashion trends change. Not that I pay attention to that, but that's what happens, right? Ecclesiastes 1 9, there is nothing new under the sun, meaning there's, nothing's going to happen that hasn't happened before. Evil rises up, been there. Evil is conquered, seen that. Christians are persecuted, seen that. Christians prosper. We've seen that, at least in various places, right? Is the Bible outdated if it discusses things that still are an issue today? Sin is sin, right? People give it different names, but it's the same thing. Outdated is a term often used in an attempt to dismiss the Bible and its teachings. This is why people say the Christian has no chance, because we're using an outdated book. When we're out, we find over and over again the Bible continues to remind us, as we look at history, we look at our own lives, we look at the time period in which we live, and we see what the Bible has to say about it. It still offers us sound guidance through difficult times. 
Some say that the Christian is narrow-minded or perhaps too narrow-minded. The world says uh, to say there is only one truth is narrow-minded. As they say there's only one church, that's narrow-minded. They say there's only one way to heaven, that's narrow-minded. But yet didn't Christ say that he was the truth, singular? That's narrow-minded, isn't it? Then he also say that he was the way, singular, narrow-minded. He is the, the way, the truth, and the life, narrow-minded in the eyes of the world. To say there is right and wrong is judgmental or narrow-minded. Yet we find any time the world tries to justify wrong, the evil only prevails and evil only flourishes. Which is to say if, if those are, who are telling us there is no right or wrong, then there shouldn't be evil in the world, right? If there is no right and wrong, nobody can do a crime. No one can commit an evil act if it's right or wrong. But yet the world, we know, of course, changes on this hourly. The world, however, that is a non-Christian, has repeatedly shown themselves to be wrong. To be narrow-minded in the eyes of the world is to find the truth and to refuse to deviate from it. In Proverbs chapter 14, and looking at verse 12, here the Bible says, There's a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. You know, it's sad today for some people, if we read that somewhere, we had to say, it seems right in the eyes of man or woman or she or he or them or they and all those other pronouns they try to use today. When the Bible gets it all by using that term mankind there in verse 12, right? There's a way that seems right to man, man and woman. But the point he's making here is it seems right, it looks good, it sounds good in the eyes of many, it feels good because no one's insulted by it. We'll wait five minutes, I'm sure they'll all find someone to be insulted by it. But in verse 12, what does he go on to say? But its end is the way of death. That easy path, the path where no one's offended, the path where there is no right and wrong, the path where we're all just okay, he says in verse 12, that end, the end of that path, it only brings about death. Some lessons for us to think about today. Underdogs, first of all, do not always lose. You know, hear people say sometimes they love a good underdog story or they love to, to root for the underdog because they're expected to lose. And so it's not to see those who are expected to lose to surprise people. History tells us those who have often been looked upon as having little to no chance of success have repeatedly surprised the naysayers. Being an underdog is not a guarantee that you will fail. It's not a guarantee. One summer when I was, oh, ninth or 10th grade, there was a basketball camp that was taking place. I knew nothing about it until one of the players who on our team became injured or sick, was the case, as I was asked to come and to, to take part in that camp. And to be honest, I was quite nervous because that usually was something I did not do. And I was not expected to be there. I was not expecting to be there. And, of course, if you know much about athletes in high school, you know that they're not always the nicest people in the world to deal with. It don't matter, it doesn't matter if you're talking about talking with the coaches, you're talking about with players. People are thinking very highly of themselves. And I was definitely the underdog when it came to people being selected to be there. But nonetheless, I was there. I won't say that I did spectacular, but I will say that I was the only one who did not get lectured during that camp. And to me, that was enough. You know, we have to realize that being an underdog is not a guarantee that you will fail. I think sometimes we, feel we, we have a bad idea about what it means to be successful and what it means to fail. The world's view of failing and being successful really depends on who you're talking about. Because someone could do horribly and then some group could say, well, they were so successful. Another group would say, well, they did horribly. Another group could do so, so well and the next group would say, well, they did horribly. This group would say, well, they did great. And so our measurement of success and failure really depends, for quite honest, who you're talking to. 
in what, uh, and really people's opinion about others, is how they base upon what is success and what is failure. God reminds us, though, that the faithful is the greatest underdog story of all. The reason for that is because the Christian is not an underdog. The Christian does not have a little chance to win. The Christian has the only chance to win. The Christian is the only one who has the chance to have heaven as their home. The Christian is the only one who has a chance to have their sins blotted out. The Christian is the only one who has a chance to overcome evil and wickedness. Through God and the sacrifices of His Son, the Christian is no longer an underdog. Regardless of what some say, the Christian will have the victory. Will have the victory over death, over sin, and over the wicked of this world. The book of Revelation, in, in short, is about the Christian, about the church, having the supreme victory over evil. We'll read it there, as we'll talk about here in just a moment, how Satan, and really as we'll find all the workers of, of iniquity, will be, ha- will be cast down one final time on the day of judgment. The Christian is not an underdog. The world will continue to paint the Christian and to paint the church as being those who are fighting a losing battle. Well, if we're honest, isn't it quite reversed? The world and all their hypocrisy, the world and all its wickedness is the one fighting a losing battle. In Revelation chapter 20, we are reminded who gets the victory. And it's not the wicked. Revelation 20 and verse 10, the Bible here tells us, The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. And they will be tormented day and night for and ever. As the New King James words it. The lake of fire and brimstone, as the Bible also tells us, which is the second death, right? You know, it's interesting we read about in the book of Revelation, we find different times where where someone is cast into a pit. But here, this is not a pit we're talking about. This lake of fire and brimstone is a final casting down of wicked, of evil, from which no one will rise up again. We find in Revelation the different times this being or this creature described as being coming out of the pit again. But the lake of fire and brimstone, we don't read about that. Because there is no rising up again. You think about there in verse 10, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Now who is doing the casting down? Well, it's God. And there they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. What does that mean? It means they're never leaving that place. But the Christian is not described as going to such a location, is he? The Christian is not described as going to a place of torment. Now, as Christians, we continue reading the book of Revelation. We find repeatedly numerous examples used to try to help us understand just how beautiful that spiritual place really is. A place the Bible tells us where the, there's a sea of glass there. Glass being completely, you know, if it's a sea of glass, we say what? We say there's no waves, right? means there is complete calm, complete peace. There's nothing causing ripples in the water. There's no violence causing the water to be stirred up. That sea of glass, the throne, that fountain of everlasting life, is a place that exists waiting for that Christian underdog who's not really the underdog after all. As you think about this this morning, we think about this concept of being those who have, quote, little, little to no chance of victory. As we really analyze and really sit down and think about that, we come to the conclusion that the Christian is the only one who has hope of victory. The Christian is the only one who has a hope of having heaven as their home. The world if we're honest, is the underdog, right? 
Because though the gospel goes out, though we teach, though we preach, though we reach out, and though we always should, isn't it Christ who tells us that few will find that way to eternal life? Matthew 7, 13 to 14. The narrow path that leads to life, and there are few who find it. The world is the underdog because the world refuses overwhelmingly to come to the truth. Which means they have little chance. Unless they come to, to Christ in obedience, they have no chance. But because they have that little chance, because they are still here, because we're still here, because they still have souls, the world, I'll use that as an umbrella term there, we still keep doing what we've always done. We still keep reaching out. We still keep teaching. And we allow the world, when we say we allow, there's something we do about it. The world will look upon us as they decide to do so in whatever form they want and look down upon us regardless of what we may do. But you know, we're not the only ones who are looked down upon. History tells us that the faithful servant of God has been looked down upon for honest, almost since the very beginning of time, right? Cain and Abel? Did Cain look down upon Abel? Yeah. He wasn't happy with him. That's why he killed him. And the world we know continues to look down upon the Christian. We must remember that we are not the underdog story here. We are the one who gets the supreme victory. This morning, as you think about these things, and we can help you or we can encourage you in any way, we're glad to assist you. That's going to be stand seeing the song has been selected. Bring Christ your broken heart, so the Lord I 